you checked your mailbox or inbox today? How many times? Well, it's true. Whether it's by email or what we now affectionately call snail mail, a letter from a familiar family member or friend is always a welcome sight, isn't it? I'm Steve Schwetz, welcoming you to Through the Bible with our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, in this study of Isaiah 36 and 37, we're going to take a look at two letters that King Hezekiah received during his reign. But while we're on the topic of letters, I want to remind you that it's Letter Month here at Through the Bible. Now, as I explained last time, Letter Month is a time-honored tradition for us. It's a month when we make an effort to ask you, our listening family, to share your stories with us. The letters that we receive, like this one from Mark, encourage our entire listening family as we go about our days. And Mark writes this. This letter is decades overdue. I used to listen to Dr. McGee in the mid-1980s. Your program helped me grow as a Christian. I had a long commute to work and got to listen to these studies on a regular basis on one of the local radio stations. I moved to North Carolina in the mid-90s, mainly for my job, where my wife and I raised our children and live today. When we moved, I stopped going to church, more because of doubts about my faith than the availability of good Bible teachers. I never completely lost my faith, but at that time, my worldview was in tatters, and I found myself an outsider to my culture. But God doesn't change. God's Word is living, powerful, and changes lives. I want to thank your supporters for keeping this program alive. I now catch myself laughing out loud at Dr. McGee's sense of humor and crying at his heartwarming anecdotes as I drive down the road. These days, I'm privileged to join you with a small monthly donation, which I would urge other listeners to consider. Don't wait as long as I did. Well, thanks, Mark. Thanks for your support of the Bible Bus and for joining us each day. We're so glad to have you aboard with us. How's God using His Word in your life? You know we'd love to hear from you. You can simply email us at biblebus at ttb.org, or you can mail your note to Through the Bible at Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109, or in Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1, or call 1-800-65-BIBLE and leave us a voicemail. Now it's time to hear about the letters that King Hezekiah received, so let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the joy of transformation that comes through the study of your word. We ask that you'd speak to our hearts as we listen and then help us to apply your truth. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Here's Dr. J. Vernon McGee with our study of Isaiah 36 and 37 on Through the Bible. Now, friends, we've come to a remarkable change in the message in Isaiah. This is now the second major division of Isaiah. And this section here is unlike that which precedes it and unlike that which follows it. This section here will leave the high plateau of prophecy and it drops down to the record of history. Even the form of language is different. Up through chapter 35, we're in a realm of poetry. Now we'll have prose from 36 through 39, and then at 40 again, we're going to pick up the poetic section. This historic interlude here makes a proper bifurcation in the two great divisions in Isaiah. The first section, what we had was, as we have seen, a judgment. That was the important thing, the government of God and the method by which God judged. Now, when we get to the last section, we'll see the grace of God. And no longer is it judgment, it is now salvation. And we'll be looking at that, of course, when we get to it. But these four chapters are wedged in here between these two major divisions. And sometimes we raise the question here, why was this put here? And the very interesting reason is, that actually this occurs in other places. And why is it repeated here? Well, there are several very significant factors which I think I should mention as we get into this historic area. For instance, the first thing I'd like to say about it, sacred and secular history are not the same. Dr. Jennings, in his fine work on Isaiah, says divine history is never merely history never simply a true account of past events. That's the end of the quotation. That means that there are great spiritual truths that are couched here in the sacred history 
that are seen only with the eye of faith. The Holy Spirit must teach us here the divine purpose in recording scriptural history. Now, I want to suggest, therefore, some reasons for this. These incidents, I think, would seem very trite to the average historian and very nationalistic, for they only pertain to the nation Israel. And yet, it concerns great world events, because what is recorded here denotes a tremendous change actually in the history of the world. And the second suggestive thing I would note would be this, that we see in this section the transfer of world power from Assyria to Babylon. And Babylon, the first great world empire, and it denotes the beginning of the times of the Gentiles. And it was actually the real menace to God's people. Now, there's another thing I should say. This section is a record of a son of David who was beset by enemies and who went down to the very verge of death but was delivered out of it and he continued to reign. Now this, I think, foreshadows the great son of David who was beset by enemies when he came, delivered to death, raised from the dead, and who's coming again to reign. This makes this a very interesting section. Now I come back to these great significant factors that are in this section. And the second one I want to mention is this here, that this is recorded three times in Scripture. You'll find it in 2 Kings 18 and 19, 2 Chronicles 29 and 30, and we've had it before us at another time, in fact, twice before. And I'll hit it, I think, rather hurriedly. Now we have the third significant and stupendous event Great miracles are recorded in this brief section. For instance, we see first the death angel slays 185,000 Assyrians. And then we see in this section the sun retreats 10 degrees on the sundial of Ahaz. And the third, God heals Hezekiah and extends his life 15 years. And this section here, it opens with Assyria, it closes with Babylon, and in this section we have two very important letters. The first one was from the king of Assyria, which Hezekiah took directly to God in prayer, and God delivered his people. Now the second letter was from the king of Babylon, which flattered Hezekiah. He did not take it to the Lord in prayer, and that led as a result to the undoing of the southern kingdom and eventually led to its captivity. But we're dealing now with a great king here. Hezekiah was a great king. And in this section, in chapter 36, we see King Hezekiah and the invasion of Sennacherib, king of Assyria. And then in chapter 37, we have King Hezekiah's prayer and the destruction of the Assyrian host. And then uh, in 38, we have King Hezekiah's sickness, and his prayer and his healing. And then, then in chapter 39, we have King Hezekiah played the fool. Now let's come back to chapter 36, and we see King Hezekiah and the invasions of Sennacherib, king of Assyria. Now, there are actually three great sections here in this second division. We have Hezekiah and Assyria. That's 36 and 37. Then we have Hezekiah and a boil, 38, and Hezekiah and Babylon, chapter 39. Now let me read verse 1. Here we have, Now it came to pass in the 14th year of King Hezekiah that Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the defense cities of Judah, and he took them. Now we have been through here a section beginning way back with Jotham, and we had Ahaz, now Hezekiah, and it began with the death of Uzziah. So now we've come to Hezekiah, who probably was one of the five great kings of Judah, because revival came in their time, Asa, Jehoshaphat, Joash, Hezekiah, and Josiah. And we have looked at this over in Chronicles especially. 
And we find that Hezekiah actually was a great king. Hezekiah began to reign when he was five and 20 years old, and he reigned nine and 20 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that David his father had done. Now, that's Second Chronicles 29, 1 and 2. Now, we have a picture here that Sennacherib, and he was king of Assyria, came down like a flood from the north. He had taken every nation along the way and flushed with victory. Now he comes to Jerusalem and, of course, expects it to fall as the others had. And this man, Hezekiah, was naturally frightened. And very frankly, although a good king and a revival came in his reign, he was, I think, a weak king because he attempted to stave off the invasion of Jerusalem by bribing Sennacherib. We're told that back in Second Kings. Hezekiah stripped the gold and the silver from the temple to meet the exorbitant commands of the king of Assyria. And it was no use because the army of Assyria was outside the gates of Jerusalem now. And what he had paid didn't help at all. You know, that's not something new. Our nation since World War II has followed a very weak policy. We have used the almighty dollar to buy friends throughout the world. And friends, we don't have many friends today. You don't buy them that way. The problem is that the real friend that Hezekiah had to finally turn to, we haven't yet learned to turn to, and of course that's the Lord. Now verse 2, And the king of Assyria sent Rabshakeh from Lachish to Jerusalem under King Hezekiah with a great army. He stood by the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field. Now Rabshakeh, the general, came down and he's parked outside the gates of Jerusalem. And he is attempting now to put uh, fear in the heart of Hezekiah and the people of Jerusalem so that they would surrender. Now Hezekiah sends out a delegation to meet with him. Verse 3, Then came forth unto him Eliakim, Hilkiah's son, which was over the house, Shebna, the scribe, and Joah, Asaph's son, the recorder. And Rabshakeh, verse 4, said unto them, Say ye now to Hezekiah, Thus saith the great king, the king of Assyria, What confidence is this wherein thou trustest? Now this man, Rabshakeh, very arrogantly expresses surprise that Hezekiah would even dare resist. And he wants to know the secret weapon in which Hezekiah trusts. And he suggests, first of all, that it might be Egypt. And he deals with these possibilities. And he then dismisses them as foolhardy. First of all, he says, is he trusting in Egypt? Well, he says in verse 6, Lo, thou trustest in the staff of this broken reed on Egypt. And actually, Hezekiah was looking to Egypt, and he wasn't getting any help there. And in this sense, this man Rabshakeh is accurate. And then he suggests something else. Is it true that you are depending on your gods? Why, he says, don't you know Hezekiah has destroyed all the high places? You see, Rabshakeh had no sense of spiritual discernment. He didn't distinguish. He thought the worship out yonder, under those groves and on the hilltops with those heathen altars was the same as the worship of the living God in Jerusalem had no discernment. And he just thought this man was destroying the worship of the people so they had no God to turn to. And you know, today, there are great many people that make no discernment every now and then. Some person will write me or some person says to me, well, after all, Dr. McGee, all the churches are the same. They're striving for the same place. They're just like old Rab Shaka. They don't seem to know that there's some difference. Well, he made a mistake here. And the third possibility that's suggested here by Rabshakeh reveals the haughty attitude of the Assyrian. There was the bare possibility that Hezekiah was depending on his own resources and manpower to defend the city. And this is what he says. 
Verse 8, Now therefore give pledges, I pray thee, to thy master, the king of Assyria, and I will give thee two thousand horses, if thou art able on thy part to set riders upon them. He says, well, now to just make things equal, why, he says, we'll give you two thousand horses, and that will make us more or less even, and even then you wouldn't be able to win. And then he suggests the fourth reason. He suggests that Jehovah of Israel has sent the Assyrian against Jerusalem, and therefore Jehovah's on the side of the Assyrian. And every now and then, well, in World War I, the Germans thought God was on their side, and we thought he's on our side. And the interesting thing is, I doubt very seriously whether he's on either side. And in this particular case, it was true God had used the Assyrian to destroy his people, but he's not going to let him take Jerusalem. And Elikim and Shebna, they said to Rabshakeh, they said, shush, don't speak so loud and speak to us in your tongue. We understand it. Don't speak in Hebrew. Because you see, Rabshakeh, he was great at giving out propaganda. Enemies always do that. And he's yelling at the top of his voice as he's giving out these different reasons. Why? Because the wall is filled with soldiers. And he wants the word to get to Jerusalem, you see, and get past these emissaries. And this man, Rabshakeh, just causes him to talk a little louder. Then they go in and they bring word to this man, Hezekiah, of what was really happening. And it was a pretty sad situation, by the way. And so what's going to happen now? Well, he keeps on saying, he says, you don't listen to Hezekiah. Beware lest Hezekiah persuade you, saying that the Lord will deliver you. He's not going to deliver you. Well, here is what happened. Verse 22, then came Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, that was over the household, Shebna the scribe, Joah the son of Asaph, the recorded to Hezekiah with a closed rent, told him the words of Rabshakeh. Now, closed rent, they speak of humiliation and shame. After all, it was said of Solomon, in all his glory was not arrayed even as a flower, but clothes, you know, they say today makes the man. Well, when clothes are rent, it speaks of humiliation and shame. Now that brings us to chapter 37, and what does Hezekiah do now with this word brought to him? Verse 1, we have it came to pass. When King Hezekiah heard it, he rent his clothes, covered himself with sackcloth, and went into the house of the Lord. This is a man of faith, by the way. And he sent Eliakim, who was over the household, and the Shebna the scribe, and the elders of the priests covered with sackcloth, unto Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos. And that's another act of faith. He wants a word from God now. Verse 3, And they said unto him, Thus saith Hezekiah, This day is a day of trouble, and of rebuke, and of blasphemy. For the children are come to birth, and there's not strength to bring forth. Now, the message to Isaiah was a pretty dark picture. It's rather pessimistic day of trouble, rebuke, and blasphemy. Now he says it just may be the Lord thy God will hear the words of Rabshakeh. And this man Hezekiah has really an aberration or lapse of faith because he speaks to the Lord as thy God. Why didn't he say our God? And he corrected it, though when he prayed, you will see that in a moment. So the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah. And now what we have here is God through Isaiah says this, verse 6, Thus saith the Lord, Be not afraid of the words that thou hast heard, wherewith the servants of the king of Assyria blaspheme me. Behold, I'll send a blast upon him. He shall hear a rumor, return to his own land. I'll cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. He won't even fall here. He's going to fall in his own land. God declares now the destruction of Assyria. And when Rabshakeh got back to his army, he found out that the king of Assyria had left Lachish and was going down to Libna to war because at that time, the king of Ethiopia and Egypt had come up. And so we find here that the Assyrian host withdraws. And this rumor that came 
that the main force of the Syrian army was being attacked by the Egyptian army, and Rabshakeh withdraws. But he sends a word to Hezekiah, said, I'll be back. And now Hezekiah in fear goes in before God. Verse 15, Hezekiah, when he received the letter now, we're told he went in and spread it before the Lord. That's verse 14. And Hezekiah prayed unto the Lord, saying, verse 16, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, that dwellest between the cherubims, thou art the God, even thou alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. Thou hast made heaven and earth. You see, every instructed Israelite didn't think that God, their God, was a local deity that dwelt in a little box in Jerusalem. He was the God of heaven, the God of this earth, creator. Now he pleads with him to hear, and he asks him to deliver. And may I say that God sends now back through Isaiah the message, and I'm dropping down to verse 35. God says, I'll defend this city to save it for mine own sake, for my servant David's sake. And what happened? We're told that the angel of the Lord, verse 36, went forth and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred and fourscore and five thousand. When they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. And that crowd that were corpses, they didn't rise. Let's understand that. Now, verse 37, So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went and returned and dwelt at Nineveh. Now, what happened to him? You'll have to turn to secular history to get the details, but here is what God said came to pass as he was worshiping in the house of Nishrash, his God, that Adramelech and Sherezer, his son, smote him with the sword, and they escaped into the land of Armenia, and Ezra Hayden, his son, reigned in his stead. Now, this is actually the history you can read today in secular history. This is what happened, and this is the time that this great kingdom of Assyria began to disintegrate and was then taken over, actually, by Babylon, because down there on the banks of the Euphrates, God has already, you remember, let Isaiah know, that he is preparing a kingdom that will be the one to take the southern kingdom into captivity. Assyria would not do it, and they did not, by the way. Now, I've very briefly covered that history because we've actually covered it twice before. But my feeling is that when God says a thing one time, it's important. When he says it twice, it's doubly important. When he says it three times, he intends for us to get the message, by the way. Now we have in chapter 38, King Hezekiah's sickness and his prayer and his healing. Now, it's very interesting how this chapter opens. It says, in those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. Not in that day. We've seen in that day is a technical expression. It looks down. Uh, beginning with the Great Tribulation period, going through the Millennial Kingdom. But now it's in those days. What days? Those days that Isaiah's writing about, when Hezekiah was sick unto death. And I think that it was at the same time that Sennacherib had come down against him. He was having trouble outside the wall with the Assyrian, and inside he's having trouble with a boil that was just about to kill him. There are those that believe it was cancer or leprosy or something like that. Apparently, it was a terminal disease that he had, and apparently his time had come. And we'll have to wait till next time to see how God intervened in his behalf and actually why the extension of the life of Hezekiah was a tragic mistake. And that's an unusual thing. We'll see that next time, and until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved. Well, if you're enjoying our study in the book of Isaiah as much as I am, don't forget that you can listen again to this study or download it for yourself. To check out all your listening options, just visit ttb.org or call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. Now, as we break for the weekend, I hope that you'll join me on the Sunday sermon for the conclusion of Dr. McGee's three-part message titled, The Millennium Versus the Great Society. 
You can download our app, which is a great way to listen, as well as listen online or on YouTube or see if your station carries the Sunday Sermon, all at ttb.org. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll see you next time when we'll hear more about God's response to Hezekiah's cry for help. God bless you now as you walk in the light of His Word. Jesus made it all, all to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Through the Bible is a five-year study of God's entire Word, and together we discover God's purposes in history and our lives, found only when we believe in Jesus Christ. Do you know Him yet?